before I caught pneumonia. My speech had been getting more slurred, so that only a few people, who knew me well, could understand me. But at least I could communicate. I wrote scientific papers by dictating to a secretary, and I gave seminars through an interpreter. And then, a tracheostomy operation removed my ability to speak altogether. After a long time, well, it seemed like a long time, somebody came up with this brilliant gadget. They didn't have it at the Cambridge Hospital. They got it from somewhere in London. This was high technology, how you can communicate with a person with no voice. It's a plastic um, piece of perspex about so big, and you've got the letters of the alphabet arranged like that in a hole in the middle. And you hold it up between you and the other person, and they look at a letter, and you can see, of course, which letter they're looking at most of the time. Sometimes you can't quite be sure. And so you would get the patient to spell out what they wanted. You know, so each letter, they have to look to pick out the A. And you say, A, you get it right. It's like a guessing game. Stephen wasn't willing to accept that he wasn't going to speak again. And he thought that he would be giving in by trying to find a method of communicating other than speech. And I remember I went in one evening, um, and this was the first time that he asked to be gotten out of bed to use the computer. Sometimes they would sit him up so that he wasn't lying in the bed all the time, as you do with a patient. But this time when I turned up, he asked the nurse, could he be gotten out of bed? Um, so he could use the computer, and he did. And I remember the first thing he typed on there after saying hello, Stephen's always very polite about things like that, um, was, will you help me finish my book? A computer expert in California heard of my plight and sent me a computer program called Equalizer. This allowed me to select words from a series of menus on a screen by pressing a switch in my hand. These words could then be sent to a speech synthesizer attached to my wheelchair. Much to my surprise, I found I was able to communicate much better than before. When eventually he went home from hospital, again, he was told he needed 24-hour nursing, and everyone was saying, well, how's he going to go in and do work? Is he going to trail around with a series of nurses after him working in the office? And, of course, he did. Um, I mean, they talked originally of him working at home, which he wasn't happy with. Um, and so after a period of recuperation at home, he just decided to go back into the office, and he'd make the trip from his house to the office, which is, I don't know, half a mile in his wheelchair, with a nurse walking along with him. And this is at the time when he was still driving around with the bag and the nasal drip. Um, going into the department, working, going back home. I began to wonder what would happen when the universe stopped expanding and began to contract. Would we see broken cups gather themselves together off the floor and jump back onto the table. Would we be able to remember tomorrow's prices and make a fortune off the stock market? It seemed to me the universe had to return to a smooth and ordered state when it recollapsed. If this were so, time would go backwards when the universe began to collapse. People in the contracting phase would live their lives backward. They would die before they were born, and get younger as the universe got small again. Eventually, they would return to the womb. It gave me my first problem to do. 
um, he asked me to look at this uh, mathematical problem. And usually when he gives a problem, he has a good idea of what the answer should be. And I went to look at it. And it took me a few months to understand what was it about. And I came back and I said, Stephen, I get this answer. And he said to me, no, that is not what I expected. I said, Stephen, that's what I get. So I went to the blackboard, explained him to what he does. He said, did you think about that particular case? I said, oh, no, I didn't. So I went back. I calculated what he talked to me about. I came back a few weeks after and I said, Stephen, I don't get this thing. I still get the same answer I had originally. So he said to me, no, 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 I, this doesn't work. Did you think about that? I said, oh, no, I'd forgotten about that particular case. So I went back to the drawing board and started calculating again. And again, I got the same answer. I went back to see Stephen, and this dragged on for about two or three months. Finally, he said to me, maybe one of your approximations is not valid. So me and a colleague decided to do the thing with computers. And then this takes a lot of time to write the programs and to be sure the program was correct. We get the answer. And it was still the way that I had said before and not the way that Stephen had said. So we went to see Stephen and we said, you see, again. I had made a mistake. I had been using too simple a model of the universe. Time will not reverse direction when the universe begins to contract. People will continue to get older, so it is no good waiting until the universe recollapses to return to our youth. Einstein once asked the question, how much choice did God have in constructing the universe? If my proposal that the universe has no boundary is correct, he had no freedom at all to choose how the universe began. He would only have had the freedom to choose the laws the universe obeyed. This, however, may not have been all that much of a choice. There may well be only one unified theory that allows for the existence of structures as complicated as human beings who can investigate the laws of the universe and ask about the nature of God. I don't know how clear-cut these experiments are, but they're experiments that have been done on sort of the timing of consciousness, and they seem to lead to a very odd picture, which doesn't even quite make consistent sense. Whether, whether refinement of these, these experiments might actually get rid of this kind of anomaly, I'm not sure, but it does look a little as though there is something very odd about, about consciousness, and somehow almost as though the future affects the past in some way, over a very tiny, limited scale, but something maybe of the order of of a reasonable fraction of a second. And there's no reason to believe that uh, one's conscious experience shouldn't be part of you know, somebody else's at, at some other stage. I mean, I don't know if it's fair to say what happens after one dies, but you could, it's a, it's a plausible picture that, that you could be somebody else. And that somebody else could be somebody that lived in the past, not in the future. Even if there is only one possible unified theory, it is just a set of rules and equations. What is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? Why does the universe go to all the bother of existing? Is the unified theory so compelling that it brings about its own existence? Or does it need a creator? And, if so, who created him? I think I would say that the universe has a purpose. It's not a, it's not a, somehow just there by chance. I mean, I think it's, yeah, so, I, it's, it's, 
I mean, you, some people, I think, take the view that the, the universe is just there and it sort of runs along and, and it's a bit like it just sort of computes. And so we happen somehow by accident to find ourselves in this thing. But uh, I don't think that's a very fruitful or, or helpful way of looking at the universe. I think that, that there is something much deeper about it.